Alex, how was it for you? Did coming out to your yeah. family? How did, how if you want to share. I know. I mine is a little more fluid. You know, I it's some of the relationships are more complicated. Um I have siblings that aren't a part of the church anymore, so it's just not really I guess discussed as openly my mom knows. Um I haven't really come out and talked to my dad about it more because he's intimidating. Um in this way and I I don't know if it'll turn into a debate. And I'm not really game for it right now, but um, but I think everyone is just kind of aware of where we stand, and um, I don't know. It's just, I, yeah, in my family, it's not as much in the forefront right now. People aren't as active, and so it just it's very non judgmental and feel in a good place. And I think it helps that this has happened so we went through the transition so long ago that I don't feel like I need, I don't, I don't know. I just don't feel like that wrestling feeling anymore of, I guess, needing to talk about it all the time. I, I kind of feel like it's pretty Zen about it. And so I think the people around us feel that from us, that we are at peace with where we're at and we're not, I don't know, conflicted about it or angry at all. We're just kind of in a good place. And I think our families can read that. Yeah, I mean, there's still some risk to coming out and talking about stuff because obviously their relationships matter more to me than anything. I don't know if they're even aware of this podcast or, you know, my dad Google Google alerts anything with my name in it. And so, you know, I'm not sure the reach will have, to be honest. But at the end of the day, you know, hopefully beyond my own personal circumstances, this is good for people and that uh, this will help people out there, you know, and I also thought a lot about this and like as far as history uh I feel like there have been a lot pe- a lot of people that have uh sacrificed a lot more in this pursuit of some kind of truth you know look at Socrates who was essentially killed for corrupting the youth or you know trying to teach them to think for themselves and uh Spinoza the famous philosopher was attacked and shunned by the Jewish community for daring to question the Pentateuch and the the teachings of the Bible and trying to embrace some kind of rationality and Galileo was put in jail for daring to uh, postulate that we might not be the center of the universe and that uh, we actually orbit the sun uh, so I think it should also cause come as a reminder to people that there was a time when religion had a lot more power than it has now and what times were like and what what it was like to try and stand up to something you know and how re- religion sort of can come to us now in this sort of ingratiating way and smiley way because over time it's had it's had to give so much uh but you know if we remember what it's like when they had real power it was a lot harder to to come forward with this kind of stuff so by that comparison this is a pretty meager you know attempt to at least do our part to live our truth as the cliche goes help anyone that yeah. that is in a similar position so um so now going back to the question that I was setting up before I asked about coming out to family, and I'm glad you've had such great, mm. I, I think you would also acknowledge that so many people yeah. become disappointments to their parents. They could cure cancer and they'd be viewed as a disappointment. Right. They're, sometimes they're cut out of the text chains. They're oh, yeah. not invited to things. They they feel awful about who they are. They lose relationships. Yep. You know, so that, much sympathy for yeah, that. Yeah, so... Hearts go out to them. You guys had oh, had it had it good, mm-hmm. and your parents yep. both are remarkable people. But um, so there, I was talking to Robert a bit about this before. There are at least two big, big uh, considerations, maybe three, when you decide whether or not to tell your story publicly. You just addressed this, but I want to just dig a tiny bit deeper. Sure. So one is that it will make family sad. Mm-hmm. It's like it's one thing to lose your faith and uh, stop attending church and maybe even resign. It's another thing to go on a podcast where the, the host has been excommunicated is viewed as an enemy of the church and as apostate and to tell the world, it's like, why can't you just keep it quiet? So there's, there's the risk of disappointing family when you do that, making it, some would say rubbing salt in the wound. There's already a wound. They're being great about it. It probably still hurts. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like a commercial business slash consideration. Mm -hmm. Like 
bands thrive kind of with the uh, super fans, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's got to be that a chunk of your Imagine Dragons fan base are, are Mormons, right? Mm-hmm. Devout Orthodox Mormons. Sure. I can't imagine a business upside to this, although maybe maybe there is. I think no one's smart enough to really know, but it certainly introduces risk. Mm-hmm. Risk of hurting families' feelings, risk of, you know, not being great for business. Yeah. How do how, what made you say, no, I still want to do this? The meaning this interview. Yeah, I mean, those are so... And, and again, you don't want to take people out of the church either. Right. So like... Yeah, I think... So I think this can go both ways. So to people that uh, are happen to be uh, super religious or in, in any stripe or are more, you know, specifically Mormon that are listening to this. And I think it's a two-way thing because I think the perception of someone like me can be that since you are still Mormon, I look down on you. I see you as dumb. I see you as intellectually inferior in some way or that you've been misled, You're, you've been duped. And so it's like, obviously, you know, there's a separation. And that's what I hate about religion right there is that separation. I don't care what religion you are as long, like Alex said, as long as you're not, not hurting other people, like p- people should be free to believe they, whatever they want. And I uh, still welcome, you know, I, for me, nothing has changed to any fans out there that might be religious or... In fact, you're probably more accepting and loving, I feel mm-hmm. like, of people and more sympathetic maybe to Mormon fans even. Absolutely. I, I just don't feel any different about them. And so for me, there's nothing coming but positive love and, and uh, affirmation. There's no, I don't look down on anybody for that. So as far as I'm concerned, our relationship can stay the same. And so it's, then it's up to them how they view me, um, which I can't control. You know, I know that uh, I sort of have an atheist bent now in my life as far as like what I see as the, the world. I, I don't like the word because it has such a toxic connotation to it now. It's sort of like an icky thing to, to it, call it divides people yeah it's, it's like i think uh washington posted a poll about this and they found that uh they asked people um if someone was gay if someone was muslim or if someone was atheist uh, who would you vote for to be a president and uh both being gay and being muslim scored higher than being an atheist so that's kind of and the, we know americans don't generally always love muslims and gay people right so <laughs> they're not super so, popular so it or, says something i think yeah. and so uh even though i have that kind of bent i'm i wouldn't call myself i don't like that word i maybe agnostic or something because you know i think atheism is really misunderstood as people think it means that I, I hate to be a cliche of what happens when you become Mormon. a lot of people do become kind of this atheist like oh i can't believe in anything then but uh Atheists don't claim that there is no God. They just claim that there's lack of evidence. Um, and so, and I think atheism is also really misrepresented in that it's not a belief system. Like, it's not a way to live your life. It's not, people say it's either you're atheist or religious. They're not in any way the same to me. It's like all atheism is is a negative, like, you're saying something might not be true. It's like, is there a word for the Easter Bunny or for Santa Claus? Not that those things are like, I'm making it trivial because those aren't the same. I know like divine creator is not the same as Easter bunny, but like there's no word for those things. It's like, it's, it's just, it's only such a small part of a person. It's like, there's this like view of that, that a person is like this guy who wears black and is a nihilist and sees no real point in the world and has an earring <laughs> <Turtleneck. laughs> and tattoos. Like I'm an atheist man. And you know, it's like, no, like atheists look like they look like me. And it's like, uh, so yeah, I, Hopefully, uh, that statistic will turn around a little bit because no matter what, the fact of the matter is that the world is getting more and more secular with each generation. You can't lie to numbers and that less and less people uh, claim to have any one religious like backing and that they would, at least when it comes to poll numbers. So this is happening, whether we like it or not. So it's like, how do we guide this thing? And, and uh, maybe that's what we can, we can talk about that later, but yeah. So what, so, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but like when this could be negative, potentially negative for, let's just say sales, or it could hurt family members. And we started with an answer to this question, but I'm just going to ask it one more time. Why do this interview when it could maybe? Yeah. I mean, we asked the same question when Dan did Love Loud. Uh, 
a lot of even on a bigger scale that was that could blow up in our faces yeah at the time you didn't we didn't you didn't know right how it would go oh absolutely not and so yeah. you know dan was really passionate about this and said i want to do this festival will you guys play it it's like whoo okay in the heart of utah you want to have a festival in saying, utah county utah county saying that the church <laughs> church's position is misguided which then yeah. apparently means that the prophets might not you know have all the answers. like you know it's it's a rabbit hole to go down to do that thing so uh the same thing was said of that, but it's like at some point you got to stop apologizing for what you believe and just stand up to it. And then do you do that despite any personal consequences? So that's it. It's just like, do what is right. Let the consequence follow. Is that so, what you're, is that basically what you're saying? What right, <laughs> I mean, also I, yeah, I, I just think that if people who are actually listening, maybe if you see a headline, Maybe it's offensive, but I mean, hopefully when you hear him, you can hear how genuine it is and that, I don't know. It's just, we really do have just love for people in different cultures and especially for Mormons. And I, I just don't really see us putting out negative energy. I hope, I hope that it's not coming across that way because that's not how we feel about it at all, especially to the individual people who are in it. Yeah, and at some point you have a platform and you have to decide what you're going to do with it. Are you going to do nothing with it? Are you going to be silent? Are you going to be that kind of person? Are you going to go your whole life just being quiet and letting other people do the dirty work for you and quite, you know, lurking on Reddit or, you know, listening to podcasts but, like, never throwing in your two cents? And I just, it's, you know, that's just not how we want to live. We want to be brave. What what good would you hope would... Because a family member could say, look, go through your faith crisis, leave the church, but just be quiet about it. Mm-hmm. You you want to do good? What good would you hope? What would be the ideal outcome of good that could come from telling your truth, from telling this story? What good do you hope comes from it? I don't really know the full potential of this yet, to be honest. I I feel like there's got to be something that we can do, and you know you're doing it too. But there's got to be an answer besides just stay in, stay in Mormonism because it's, it's, it's broken, but it's the best thing we got. There's got to be a place for people like me who are so made that they cannot believe. Right. And uh, there are so many positive aspects of Mormonism. Um, we can, you know, we, we can go on, on and on about it. The sense of community you get from Mormonism. The, uh, you know, it's been proven that like, it's like a placebo effect. Religion does make people happier. It... it uh, you know, just like when you take a pill um, before or after surgery, even if even if you know it's a placebo, this is a National Ge- Geographic article I read. Even if you know it's a placebo, it still helps you recover faster. And religion has, I think, is it's like spirituality and faith, and having faith that you're going to be healed, that kind of stuff. Like, I think that's a really good argument. Like, there's you stuff, live longer. Yeah, there's r- good arguments for religion, and, and uh, I don't know whether the good really outweighs the bad. To be honest, I don't know if the Things that are in religion are uniquely good to only religion. I think there's got to be some secular humanist approach to where to go forward with all this stuff without that's much bigger than Mormonism because I got to tell you, the world is a much bigger place than just this thing. Um, and I've seen that firsthand that, you know, it's like what 0.01% of the world's population is, is in this thing. And so there's got to be some sort of secular response that's bigger than just any one religion some movement I'd love to be a part of, but I don't really know what and how that would look like, you know, all, all that. And that's kind of what Thrive is trying to figure yeah. out is like, what's next? Right. It's not obsessing about polyandry or Fanny Alger right. or hieroglyphics. It's like, let's be positive. Let's focus on healing and growth. And what can we build towards? Right. If for those of us who can't stay Orthodox Mormons, then what, what can we build? Mm-hmm. That's part of it. Yeah, definitely. Very yeah. fair. And then there's also just like for those suffering in silence like you who don't have a voice. Go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, I mean, just the sheer fact of how much Mormon stories have helped us. It's like you want to keep the ball rolling. You want to keep telling your, you know, because each individual has a different experience and maybe just one thing that they say reaches you. And I remember certain things that just one person said on a podcast. And if we're able to help anyone with even 2% of this, then we've done our job. And um, 
you know, you're not alone. And even though we had each other, we felt alone in the grand scheme of things for a little while. And, you know, that's not where you should be. Yeah. And it's along with those lines, any, as far as advice, if there is anyone listening that's like going through this now, because I know people in my personal life, I don't need, I don't want to out, but I know that there's people out there that are going through this right like the, in the heart of it, like finding out this stuff right now, or maybe listening to me has made them want to look at stuff. Uh, just take it slow and some things simply take time. Uh, it's like a bad breakup. It's like some things are only healed by just taking your time and going slowly. And I promise you that life isn't just going to suddenly get worse for looking into stuff. Uh, it's going to have its ups and downs. It's not going to be perfect. And there's going to be a lot of, of heartache when it comes to like relationships. I know all that stuff, but, um, and look, you know, even us, it's like trials and hardships do still happen when you leave. It's not like, uh, and you have to find other ways to deal with it. Like our youngest daughter, Sunny, uh, that was, I, I can't, I think that was the biggest, you know, worry or trial or, you know, episode of our lives that we've had thus far as a what couple. Happened? Happened? Um, so Sonny was, uh, eight months old in, in Alex's belly and we were living in Vegas at the time and about ready to just kind of do that final stretch into, you know, another month and there was going to be a baby on the way. Everything was looking good and normal. Baby was measuring a little small, but other than that, it was fine. We went into a, the last sonogram before she gave birth and the uh, doctor uh, was like, well, that's a kind of a small baby, but everything looks okay. You know, if you felt like you wanted to, do, you know, do another sonogram, you know, you're welcome to, but I think everything's okay. And, you know, but if that's something you want to do, we can set you up with someone else to look, take a look. She's just a little small, but she's fine. And we just thought, mm, I think we need to, when you, when someone t- tells you that, yeah. you, well, let's get a second opinion. Let's get a second opinion. So we went and to like a more specialized doctor to a, to a high risk pregnancy center and awesome sonogram technician, uh, found that she had a heart defect that is pretty hard to catch and, uh, kind of unrelated to her size. So it was mm-hmm. pretty random that we basically the valves know. in her heart were switched. The le- the one that's supposed to be going to her lungs was going to the rest of her body. And the one that's supposed to go to her body is going to her lungs. And it's just, that just wasn't going to work. And so a lot of times, uh, these uh, babies are birthed just fine because there's a little valve in the heart that will uh, Opening of a opens way. for a few days and then it closes only after a few days. And that's when you, it's like blue baby. Like that's where this that comes from is you'll, you'll just go home with the baby and, and not be able to do anything at that point because the doctors didn't see it. And this, this valve slowly closes and then you're left with the blood going to the wrong places. And so, we were really lucky to catch it and just, you know, uh, it was still a really big uphill climb and we were really unsure if she would make it and we had to finally do a C-section and the day came to have her and they just whisked her right away and we barely even got to see her and it was just nick you for a long time after. Open heart surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, you go through things like this and I, you know, I, I will, I don't know. It's hard to talk about. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I did. This is, this is like a very tender thing for us, but, um, It's still new. She's only 11 months. (laughs) Yeah. Um, wasn't that long ago. And so it's, you know, religion in in those instances, religion can be really helpful. And, you know, it's like you say prayers and, you know, you just give blessings and like, you have this like, this kind of blanket that you can kind of wrap yourself around and like feel better about stuff. And, and even if the baby passes, it's like, well, I'll see yeah, you in the next life. The next life mm-hmm. Exactly. And so th- to have that, that was an interesting experience to have that sort of th- not have that, that safety rope anymore. And just like, okay. What was that like to not have the safety net, you know? <sighs> Want me to take it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so for us, uh, it, it, I think it's also in how you look at it. Um, so basically you can look at it two ways. There's a loving Heavenly Father that's seeing you go through this and is going to ultimately decide whether that baby lives lives or dies. Or you can view it as, wow, what an amazing thing that this was caught. Thank God for the thousands of years of human progress that and how many babies have died of this. 
and how many babies had to die in order that this kind of surgery can even be done. And uh, thank God for these doctors that have trained their whole lives to do this kind of stuff. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, exactly. And I, you know, look, and I did say, I, I'm not, I won't be too proud to say it, said some prayers, just to whoever was there. So, you know, it's not like I'm, uh, humans are complex people. Right. And uh, yeah. in times of stress, this kind of stuff happens. But ultimately, you know, it was about putting our trust in people. There was human beings from nurses to doctors that dedicated their life to doing this stuff. And perhaps instead of putting all thanks to God when these things go right, maybe we should be thanking all the people that came before us that lived by comparison, me, pretty terrible lives in order for us to have the opportunity to have our baby make it when there was no chance in any other time in history that this was possible. So put a little bit less on God, a little bit more on the people that are actually actively doing the surgery and being grateful for them and just still being in awe, still, still having room for the, lumin, the, you know, the luminous and the, and the transcendent, you know, just because... I'm not necessarily sorry about the God que- I'm not sure about the God question doesn't mean that I, I, I lack the ability to uh, be awe inspired by something and, and to life can still be a miracle. Life is still a miracle and, and maybe even more so when you take God out of the equation, you know the fact that we're here and on a spinning rock in an unknown made part of, of the universe made out of stardust indeed. so I don't know, it was just sort of you know it's also like you know if this baby goes and it just wasn't meant to be it wasn't that just wasn't. You know, it, it was always going to happen that way, and uh, you, you have to look at things a little differently. But I don't know if it necessarily helps to say God saw it happen and, and chose to take that baby. I don't know. I don't know personally how much that would help me. Rather than saying, you know, it was just a thing that happens. We are human. We evolve slowly over time, and we are an evolution in progress. And humans are not perfect. Sometimes they're born uh, imperfect, and just it's just part of what it means to be human and to to be alive. Uh, so it was a lot, I don't know how much different it would have been for us, you know, having faith or not. It's just, it's, it's a difficult thing and people navigate all kinds of ways. Right. I, I felt like the whole process was sort of fight or flight and I don't, if I were religious, I don't know if that would have changed my reactions. I, I don't think, I don't, I don't know if I would have felt better if we lost the baby thinking I would see her after, I don't know, because it's just, I'm a person who I wanted that baby here and I, and we do have that baby here and she's amazing and we're grateful every day for it. But yeah, I, I just felt like, I don't know, selfishly, I, I didn't want to think of big picture that way, whether we had religion or not. I just, I wanted things to work here and now and I was grateful for the people who put in the time um, not praying but instead going to school to learn how to do this and to fix our daughter and they did and they were amazing and she's here and she's perfect so <laughs> amen <laughs> mm, thank you thanks for sharing that's a great illustration yeah so um, the couple, couple things about uh Kind of looking forward, right? Yeah. So let's go back to the band for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, three, three really successful albums. Four. Kind of, four, sorry. Wait a minute, which one did I miss? After Evolve, we had another one. What was that? Through another one out there, it's called Origins. Or, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, so Believer was on what? Uh, Evolve. Mm-hmm. Evolve. And then they dropped a second one, but have not toured on it. Yes. And I'm still upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So four albums, Mm -hmm. all, I mean, you guys were the most streamed band on Spotify last year, 2018. Is that right? Something like that? I think something like that. (laughs) So a world phenomenon sensation, right? How's, like, what are you able or wanting to say about, like, where the band is now and and where it might go? Like, you want a break? Are you guys kind of taking a break? We are taking a break. Yeah, we, as you can tell, I can't, I'm, terrible with dates i feel like my like the last 10 years of my life have just it's been, been a like, blur it's been a complete blur and so it's been so nice to just slow down and like take it a day at a time and to be a person again that's not just part of 25 percent of something bigger than any one of us and just be an individual i think all the guys feel the same way so the break has been incredible 
And you're uh, enjoying it very much. So yeah, and, being home. Yeah, yeah. But you know, obviously, music is still a passion of ours, and we're gonna keep playing and he writing. He still and, writes music like a full time job. Yeah. Which is oh really? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. You're making songs all the time. Yeah, we're we're writing. With Dan, like with some, some with yeah, uh-huh. some by yourself. Yeah. The wheels are still turning. <laughs> always turning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's always like, for any, for, I mean, there's always the Rolling Stones and U2 and the Beatles, but they're like, not just 99th percentile, they're 99.99 percentile, <laughs> right? right? Mm-hmm. But then like, there's always this, there's generally this life cycle of the band. Very, very few ever make what you guys have already accomplished Mm -hmm. and then there's like trying to sustain it yeah and that it just seems like and i I remember talking to tyler glenn about this like one of the hardest things it seems like it would be to be a musician is you can't control what people like right Mm -hmm. you 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 write because you love the music you put it out there because it's the best you have to offer Mm -hmm. people either like it or they don't usually they don't love it but occasionally you strike gold or lightning or whatever but then to like always have to stay on top and stay popular. Plus, I think there's just a natural tendency for people to want new things. Mm-hmm. And then there's also like, I don't want to, I don't want to like the band that my parents liked, or that's the that band was big three years ago. Right. So like, at some point, it's like you reach this high and then you try and maintain it, but then it it has to be exhausting and at some point impossible. To maintain the momentum so then you're facing at some point a decline now you guys may still have five more awesome albums but at some point everyone's got to face that reality mm-hmm. unless you're like sting right you know what i mean mm-hmm. so like anything you want to say about that or is that just like where well that was depressing no uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe or you or you become bigger than the beatles like we don't know we don't know but i mean is, it, is that a reality am i describing something that's true or i mean uh yeah I, who knows i, I have the, the worst perspective on this stuff you know I, or the best which is you just do it because you love it i do it because i love it and you know we we I, you're right there's there's so much we can't control in people's taste there's eventually the band will end and like all good things do. And, um, I think if your identity has been the band, if you're, if that's what you see yourself as, is just as this big thing that I think that maybe, uh, that could be troubling, but as you know, it's, I'm also just an individual who will be making music regardless of how many people listen to it. And that's maybe that's been part of the success too, is that we're constantly doing this. Like, I know that you know we're not alone in this, but I know that Dan writes feverishly. I've never seen anyone write half as many songs as him. Um, his work ethic is insane, and and my I, I'm always writing tracks, and we're always sending stuff back and forth. So you're just doing always. what you love. You are just always. doing even, what you love, even on breaks. So as much as it's true that we cannot control, we what we can control, we do, and that's by working really hard and. I don't know. Just uh, I think if you take breaks and stop doing stump something for long enough, you kind of get rusty at it. So for ten years, we never stopped, even when we're on breaks. We just we try and favor those odds as much as we can, and try and create luck as much as we can. And the rest is really is out of our control. But and it'll last as long as it lasts. And at any point, I can say it's been an incredible ride, and uh, what a unique honor to be able to play for people on stage and have that be something people pay you for. Uh, if I really ever stop to think about it, it's, that's a really humbling thing. <laughs> you know, 12-year-old me would be beyond words and would be blown away by how things worked out in my life. So ultimately, I'm a really happy guy and extremely lucky. Anything you want to add to that part, Alex? Yeah, I, you know, I think... I think how he explained it is that, you know, he's really secure. I mean, I guess it's our life. Uh, it changes my life as well and the kid's life as well. But um, Daniel's really secure in himself as an individual of this four piece. And so, yes, maybe to the outside world, that big chapter ends. But I, I think there's just so much more to come. And to think that, I mean, I'm one of those optimists that just I look forward to 
you know, what life has to bring at every stage and it's going to be different and it's going to be challenging, but, um, our kids are going to be growing. They're going to be going through different stages and we get to experience that as a family. And we're so lucky to be able to do that. And I think it'll be great either way. <laughs> Beautiful. Is there a sense that there's more you guys want to do? Or I mean, in, in what way? Anyway, just like, there's more we got to achieve. There's oh, I see. Un, un, there's territory always, unconquered. Like There's always that. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter how successful you are. There's always, you're always looking to the next thing. We've all, yeah, we, we honestly barely even uh, celebrated a Grammy. Like, I don't, I think we just said good job or something. And that was... On to the next thing. That was our celebration. It's like, cool, we got it. Great job, guys. And then literally, that, not even a dinner. <laughs> it's just like, what's the next thing? Uh, what else can we do? It's just, you know, we're kind of ravenous and unfulfilled in a, <laughs> in a, in a, good, way. In a twisted way, maybe in a good way too. But just, you know, there's always something that we could be doing better and our show could be better in this way or that way and our songs could be better this way. It's just how we th- see things and... I think it's part of my personality as well, like as far as in my faith, like I fancy myself a bit, like I really, when I was LDS, I really got into the doctrine and I really studied it and I really tried to have knowledge, what I thought was like true knowledge and, and, you know, from reading all the books you're supposed to read and um, just trying to be able to hold a conversation with anybody about a conversation with anybody about Mormonism, be able to hold my own and feel really confident in it, in the history of it. And I feel like since my scope is sort of widened and I know this isn't true of everyone because some of the smartest people I know are Mormon and the most knowledge hungry people I know. But for me, Mormonism acted as a bit of a blanket, like where it's just like, ah, the next, like Alex was saying, it's like, we're about the next life. This knowledge yeah, it doesn't make sense, but we'll figure out the next life. And now my outlook is very much more, this is the life to figure it out. This one. This is the only life, life that's guaranteed. I'm not saying there's no afterlife. I'm only saying that you have no evidence for it. And I better make this life count. Because as far as I know, this is what I've got. So, uh, I don't know. I feel like now that and whenever I, whenever I encounter anything that tries to answer everything, it always seems to answer nothing. And so I'm learning more and more that I know less and less by things. And so, like I said, like my circle is kind of influence, my circle of influence has changed, like who I'm reading now. And like, I do find myself in the same thing of, and like, I just thought about this yesterday, like I'm still in the same thing of trying to figure out where I came from and where I'm going. (laughs) So like in my quest, like what I've gravitated toward is like evolution, you know, evolutionary biology, like getting super fascinated with that, you know, Richard Dawkins, um, the wine, uh, Brett Weinstein, like, you know, really like figuring out like what, you know, the, uh, Huval, uh, Yuval Harari book, Sapiens, you probably know. Yeah. Just sure. like really find trying to find out like Homo Deus, Homo Deus and, uh, Sapiens and just like, wh- what are we, how do we get here? Like as far as we can tell what's happening. And then like, also I've been super into, uh, Sean Carroll, uh, Lawrence Krauss, a- astrophysicists of like, you know, the big picture stuff. And like, I'm obviously an idiot and I don't understand half the stuff I read in Sean Carroll's books <laughs> about quantum phys- like quantum mechanics, quantum physics. But I just find it to be so much more gratifying and so much more rewarding of a way to live my life. Um, because all these men, what they have in common is that None of them pretend to know all the answers and they're all, uh, they all depend on the scientific method to, to find out where they're going with next, you know? So, you know, I'm not gonna have all the answers and when I die, I won't have all the answers. Um, but that I've learned to be okay with that. And that's one thing that's different in Mormonism is that the unknown is a little bit scary and I, and stepping out of that can be daunting for people. But honestly, it's gotten to the point now where I'm glad that none of it's true and I, I'm happier now than I've ever been outside of Mormonism. And there is a path that leads to happiness that isn't a religious one. And, um, yeah. So I don't know. What's that like? What's it like for you, Alex? Like you, you lived so many years, decades, even 
someday it'll make sense. Someday I'll get that feeling, you know, and then all of a sudden you realized I was holding out because it wasn't going to come. So now you're where you are. How's that? Yeah. I, I mean, I, are you feeling peace? I am. I'm feeling a lot of peace. I'm feeling relief. Um, I'm feeling confident in my own thoughts and, uh, in my own judgments of things. And I, you know, I, I feel like I don't need to second guess my opinions to make sure they align with someone else's. And I, I just feel good with living each day and enjoying that day and trying to stay in the moment rather than what's going to happen in the far future that I can't control. And yeah, I feel like we're feeling pretty good. So, so have you thought about like constructing another theology or uh, trying other churches? Like it's any sense of spirituality. Has any of that been a, a, a longing or a need for you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I've kind of, I'm at the place where I'm just, I think trying things out, not in terms of religion, but just in terms of what uh, spiritually grounds me, whether that's, um, going for a late night walk under the moon, um, and talking about, you know, what we're researching, what we're listening to, what what we're reading, um, whether that's spending time with our kids or a beach weekend together or going on a hike and just finding what, um, kind of brings me back to what's important and, um, just this kind of revolving around our family as of now. I love it. And then kind of the two big fears that people have, uh, contemplating leaving the church or seeing others leave the church is why and how would I ever be moral? Why would I ever be faithful to my spouse? Why would I ever stay married? Why would I ever not become a prostitute or a drug addict? Or even why would I even want to live, mm-hmm. right? If If the church isn't true, that's one. So can you have meaning and morals in life without the church? So how have you found that? And then there's how in the world can you raise healthy, happy, moral kids hmm. yeah. without the church? How have you, when you first and then Alex, like how have you come down on personal morals and meaning and then raising kids? Um, yeah, I thought about this a lot too. Um, so basically the argument is God is the absolute truth. God, God is the compass for morality and, if that's off the table, then it's all off the table and we're all left to our own devices to come up with our own morality. And that, that's scary because look what can happen. Uh, you know, Maoism, and Stalinism, yeah. uh, Nazism, look at all these so, so-called atheistic uh, machines and look how, look how off course we can get when we rely only on reason and stuff. But I mean, so that one way I like to describe it is... Um, my favorite book of all time is Crime, uh, Crime and Punishment. Have you read it? Dostoevsky? Yeah, yeah. It's, is that right? Mm-hmm. It is, I think it's a, probably the best book ever written. Uh, the book you told me to read, by the way, was amazing too. My name is Asher Lev. That is... Did you read it? Requi- that is required reading <laughs> yes. as far as I'm concerned. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, I, I had no idea. Kind Potok. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, so basically in this book, there's this main character, Raskinolikov. Rask- Rask- Crap, how do you say it? Um, something like that. I, I butchered it. Raskinolikov or something, but uh, I've never actually said it out loud. I've only yeah, read it. Right. <laughs> but uh, uh, essentially, he is a poor law student uh, growing up in Russia, and he lives in the city, and in the city there is a pawnbroker who is just a hag by any standards, a complete scourge on, on society, a complete uh, negative uh, uh, um, drain. Yeah, drain on society. She takes advantage of people in her pawn shop. She doesn't get, you know, she's... She has no fem- no meaningful meaningful relations with anybody. She's nasty. She's mean. By all accounts, it would be, it would be better if she wasn't born, or, or it'd, be, it'd be better if she was killed. And so that's the, the, this uh, poor law student who uh, then kind of thinks, well, wait a minute. Like, if it really would be moral, if I killed this woman, why don't I just do it? Like, I should just do it. it if I'm not, if I if I can uh, take off the shackles of Judeo, Judeo-Christian morality and just think rationally here for a minute then it makes sense so we did it so he actually went through with it he got an axe and killed this woman uh and essentially created a close to a perfect murder you know he essentially got away with it and uh 
he would have got away with it, but there was like, you know, he had this sort of, something happened to him inside from doing that. There was just like this thing deep inside that Christians would probably say is like this deeply, you know, held belief that's, that's, you can't do that kind of thing because there's a, a moral law higher than just man's law, right? And so um, he's filled with this torment. He goes into the fever pitches and he essentially just like confesses at the end of it because he just can't take it anymore. And he goes into Siberia to prison and he has this sort of rebirth. And it's like, this is kind of like what pe- what people like to use to argue against atheism uh, is that this is what, this is what, it goes off the rails really quick this way. And so uh, I definitely refute that uh, for a lot of reasons. I think that um, there's something deep inside people that makes you not want to kill each other. And it, I don't, I think it far outdates any biblical precepts. Um, I don't think we as a species would have gotten as far as we did unless we had something inside us that said to, to get along and to not kill each other. Right. It's, there's just, it just makes sense. We didn't get all the way to Mount Sinai and then say, Oh wow, we shouldn't kill each other. Like, <laughs> this is amazing. Like, how did we get that far? How, and by the way, there's no evidence that Mount Sinai even existed in the first place, <laughs> but, um, that's besides the point. Um, so I think that you, you, you can't just throw over the whole game of monopoly by saying, you know, if, if there is, if God is an ultimate morality, then there is no ultimate morality and, and it's all chaos. You just want to flow, flip over the board and say, no one can play this game. No one can play this game of morality. And I, I think that's completely wrong. I think that uh, if you look at people and what they do with the Bible, I mean, look at, you know, the Bible, it's like how many genocides are committed in the Bible. You know, it condones essentially sex slavery in the Bible, the treatment of homosexuals in the Bible. Uh, really immoral things happen. Um, I think the whole uh, sacrifice of Isaac is completely immoral. Um, but we, you know, if, if an angel told me to sacrifice one of my kids, I'd tell him to go, <laughs> you know what? Yeah. And uh, so human beings by nature choose morality. They choose which parts of the Bible to ignore or to accept. Book of Mormon is the same way. I think there's some immoral, immoral teachings in the Book of Mormon. like uh, Sort of layman. Yeah, sort of Laban, Nephi, and uh, black people having the mark of Cain, or you know what yeah. I mean. And uh, I think we were speaking about Korhor earlier. I think the whole right. I, I reread Korhor just recently, and I was really deeply disturbed mm-hmm. by it because uh, it's anti-intellectual. It's right? basically it's someone's. It's basically Korhor questioning says questioning and right, thinking. He's basically like saying he's questioning. He's being like basically Socrates in the mm-hmm. situation, mm-hmm. Uh, saying like you know going counter to the narrative that was believed and uh, basically duping people into believe there was no God. And so what happened to Korhor? He was struck dumb and, and mute. He was struck mute, right? And he couldn't speak. And he said, basically, he wrote down basically like, I was deceived by the devil. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> please unmute me. <laughs> and I think it was Alma that was who was the, I don't remember, but uh, basically said, no, I know your heart and I know that you would have just kept saying that crap and I'm going to leave you uh, mute. And then he, is, is, he ends up getting trampled to death. Dies an ignominious death. Yeah. And it's just, it's like, man, how do, is this really like a how God teaching? rolls? So <laughs> I, I think most Mormons are really good people and they wouldn't do, they wouldn't treat Korhor that way. So my whole point is that it's a really big misnomer that we get our morality from from scripture because each person has cherry picks their own parts of of what something deep inside them that says that's not right that you know slavery is not right even though it says so in the bible that kind of stuff so i think that whole argument is bunk it's kind of a faith in the potential of humanity right is that right yeah i think i think i'm not and i don't at all doubt that the the utility, like like you said, of religion, I I don't doubt it at all. I think it's been with us for a reason, and uh, it stayed with us. You know, even in evolutionary terms, it stayed with us for a reason, right? I mean, the uh, tribes that instituted religion multiplied and flourished. The They're ones that, the ones that didn't died out. Died out. Yeah. And that, there's a reason for that. So the utility of it, I do not argue with it at all. And um, but I also think that there is other signs of evolution that aren't so great. For instance, our love of sweets, one thing uh, at one time was good, good for us, 
uh, when we saw a date tree, it's like you go for it because you know get the calories, get the calories in. You don't know when the next date tree is coming, and and get it while you can. So now we're all programmed to just love sweet things, leading to heart disease and diabetes, and literally killing us. So our evolution is killing us in that regard. So uh, we're dying of our. You know, people used to die of their teeth. You know, the molars, our back molars, are of no use. Our appendix is of no use anymore. Uh, People's propensity to believe in uh, false positives. you know, essentially, the, the our ancestors that believed that there was a tiger in the grass when they heard a, a rustling in the wind, uh, those were the ones that eventually survived and reproduced. Were the ones that thought, ah, it's just the wind. Uh, so the ones that I think the words anthropomorphized their surroundings are actually the ones that ended up surviving. So no wonder we're a little bit skittish. No, no wonder we're prone to believe in things that are uh, otherworldly or meta- metaphysical. Because I mean. It, it all makes sense if you, to me now, in the in the grander scheme of things. I don't want to drone on and on about this stuff. I could, but anyway. <laughs> it sounds like you're hoping that we can, there can be a positive what's next for those. Yeah, who- and I, I and I'm, I don't want to come off as hating religion or saying it's, like, there's, there's people like Christopher Hitchens who I adore. He is my, he is my uh, intellectual, like, Miles, like, He's who I want to be like intellectually. God rest his soul. God rest his soul. He is to me the epitome of what it was to be a well-spoken uh, anti-theist. But I, I don't go as far as him. I'm not an anti-theist. People like Richard Dawkins say religion is a a meme that is a vi- it's a virus meme. It's like you know it has it's it has to be eradicated. And I I think that's a really un- that's the only thing that I think Christopher Hitchens got wrong mm-hmm. among all the other stuff he got right. And by the way, anyone listening, go and check out a <laughs> a debate where especially. He deb- he'll debate any Christian and completely wipe the floor with them, and it's so entertaining <laughs> to watch. But uh, I digress. But um, <laughs> so yeah. So uh, what was I talking the about? The one thing that Christopher Hitchens maybe had. Yeah, that, that's, thank you. That's the one thing I think he kind of got wrong is that he does a disservice by saying that religion is this stupid thing that stupid people believe, and that's not what he was saying. But it's it, more like devil's advocate. Yeah, he, he was being a devil's advocate there. But I think that there's. By alienating those people, you're not really forwarding the conversation because religion has been with us for this long and there's no reason to believe it's not going to continue with right. us into the future. So just saying you all are stupid and we got to move past this, I, I see I see that. Even though I want to say that, I see that that's very unhelpful right. in, the, in the big scheme. So in going forward, it's like I don't have all the answers. you know. And as far as the Mormon church, I, I really don't envy their position right now. I don't wish I was the leaders in the church right now because I understand it's a really tricky thing that they're going through. I know that it's not just one big, they don't all see eye to eye on every single issue on this stuff. And it's like they're damned if they're doing, they're damned if they don't. Because if they go forward and say all this stuff and say, yeah, look, we're going to air all the laundry. This is exactly what happened. You're going to have a lot of members saying, WTF, like, (laughs) why was I not told about this stuff? And if you stay silent, then people in our generation, we're just not, we're not having that. We have (laughs) access that we didn't have before. So... I don't know the way forward. It's a lose for them. lose. It's a lose it's lose a for lose them, lose. and so I'm not sitting here saying trying to attack them. It's like because I believe that most. It's like I feel like the church itself has its own is its own individual, and every member of the church, no one, no one person is controlling the narrative of the church. It's just this, not a monster, but it's this thing that's bigger than just one person. And I would never blame one individual, one leadership, one, one leader in the church for saying leading. You know, it's just it's so much bigger than that, and so I don't. I, I don't envy their position, but it's not, you know, I, I don't, I don't know uh, right. the way forward for them because I, I mean, you, you have a better gauge of this than anyone that people our age, it's, just, it's, it really is a lot of people are leaving. It's right? a losing battle for the millennials. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Alex, what about raising kids? Like you don't have the church as your s- social and let's just say moral support. Are you worried? They're still young, so... Yeah, they're still young, so it's hard to say. I mean, I'm worried about everything for parenting because <laughs> right. I don't know what I'm doing. it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it's the worst <laughs> and the best. No, uh, but I, I, same thing as Daniel said earlier. I felt like my parents are what made us moral people, um, more so than the church guided us. And we had a community of cousins that we loved, and we had friends, and we had activities. And so I think there's a place to find community elsewhere i mean i would i'm still i think we're still in search of another form of community that Mm -hmm. could be helpful to us um a more secular community but yeah i mean i'm worried in the same way 
all parents are worried about having moral, well-behaved children, but I don't worry about it especially. Because if you can just be good parents, that goes a long way. And it's kind of refreshing to not feel like I need to teach someone something that I don't believe in. I'm only going to teach them truths that I I know, you know? I mean, as, as best I can, or at least I know for the time, and um, that might evolve, and I might be wrong, and I might say the wrong thing, but at least it'll be from me and not from something else I'm regurgitating, mm. hopefully. I mean, and I'm open to stuff. I'm, I'm o- like, I don't know what next step should be, really. I mean, I... Mormon, you know this. I mean, Mormons can be a skittish bunch after their faith crisis. It's like the whole point is that they don't want to be a part of something. The whole point is that they were just in something that uh, left maybe a bad taste in their mouth. So I think as a group, we're maybe a, a hard, a hard bunch to wrangle together and all get to agree on anything. So I totally get that, but uh, I can't help but think there's something that we can all agree on, and that there's some common ground. The all anti you know, the all ex Mormons uh, share. You know, it's like my dream personally. You know, we talk about uh, Maoism and Stalinism and Hitler and all that stuff. I mean, I would love to be a part of society that uh, actually uh, embraced real humanists and real secularists, because none, none of those three people were that. You know, you know, show me a society that's. Uh, Embrace the teachings of Epicurus, Democritus, uh, Galileo, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, uh, David Hume, uh, Sa- Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. Name me that civilization that has embraced those secular concepts and fell into ruin and chaos. Brene, Brene Brown. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Maya mm-hmm. Angelou. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I, that's my dream is like, man, if we could like, there, there's got to be some counter movement that still makes people feel a part of something because you know it's like what do you do because it's like Mormons don't want to like go to sun like something on Sunday again that's they just escape that they don't want to like you know give some money to an organization anymore they just did that like yeah I don't know what the or, maybe, or surrender their authority yes mm-hmm. right moral or otherwise right so how do you wrangle a bunch of people that <laughs> like that I, I don't have the answer I don't know yeah yeah I don't either <laughs> <laughs> But we're, you know, we're seeing where it goes, right? Right. Sometimes I want to create that Zion, that secular Zion. Yeah. And then I just realize that's going to fail because it's too hard and nobody, nobody's up for it. Right. And that's the, and and that's that's the thing about repeating the problem. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what religion does so well. Like the very fact that it requires so much of you is what makes it so enticing. Yeah. Like if it, if Mormonism didn't like make, wasn't hard or didn't. That was part of your identity. We were the kind of people who could do hard things. And sacrifice, yeah. Yeah. And and they created something worth sacrificing for because the the end goal was so big. Mm -hmm. The the prize was so big. Exactly. Then you'd give everything for it. Yep, exactly. So minus that, what do you have? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but some would would slip into nihilism and say, well, then there's no point in life. But you guys aren't doing that. No. You're not feeling like... Because you hear those... Well-intended Mormons are like, I'm so glad we have the church because if we didn't, why would I even want to live? Right. You don't feel that way. Well, this is this is all we know. So this is the only time we know we can live. I mean, maybe there's an afterlife. I'm not saying there isn't. But if this is all I've got, then this is what I want to enjoy. So it makes you even more interested. Oh, way more excited about life. And I think people might surprise themselves if, you know, if they find out some truths aren't true. I don't, I don't think they're going to just put their hands up and say, I'm done. Right. That doesn't really give themselves a lot of credit. So mm. I wouldn't, you know, yeah. or I would just be an alcoholic if I could have a drink of liquor, which I, I kind of thought that about myself. But it's you're not giving yourself much credit. Do you not have self-control in other aspects of your life? Then why would this be any different? You know, I mean, that that's yeah. a whole other argument. But, right. you know, give yourself some credit that you're a better person than, you know, don't rest all your laurels on someone's religion. I don't know. Yeah. Amen, sister. So I, instead of like waiting to the very end, and that's what I'll just say it again, a plug for Thrive, mm. November 17th, Wayne Sermon will be keynoting along with Amber Scora from Leaving the Witness, me, Natasha, Christian Moore, Stephanie Sorensen Larson, hopefully John Hamer, uh, you know, maybe Donna Showalter. Like we have a lot of great, Spencer Nugent, like we have a lot of great people lined up. Check out thrivebeyondmormonism.com. 20, 15 bucks for an entire day. 
or losing money, but we just want to. I, I'm thinking of it as a secular general general conference. I love it. If we could get our best and brightest together, what 20 minute talks, or in your case, maybe 30 or an hour minute talk, what what could we produce in terms of wisdom for for our tribe? Yeah, mm-hmm. we're not trying to put down anything. Right, we're not going to be negative. We're looking forward. What wisdom and encouragement and energy and community can we create? That's the idea. I love it. That's why I'm glad you're, thank you for being willing to. 100%. That sounds right. That's right up my alley. And so thank you. Thank you for doing it because, you know, it's easy to talk about stuff like this, but this is a doing thing, you know. So I think we can create something cool and, you know, it's not going to require every Sunday be taken away. You can still have your second Saturday, but (laughs) to have some middle ground, right, where you can feel like you're a part of something. Uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm just looking forward to meeting people that have got like, we've only talked to like, even now we only, we've only talked to like five or six people about that's this amazing. stuff. That's amazing. That's right. amazing. So more selfishly when we go there, it's just like, here's going to be, you know, some hundred people that know exactly what I'm talking about and that we can finally have this sense of community. I think that's really exciting. I love it. Alex, we'd love to have you if you can come. Oh, I'm happy yeah. to be there. All I'm right. excited. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so that's thrivebeyondmormonism.com. Please register. We want to get 4,000 people there. We want it to be the largest assembly of forward-looking, healthy, positive, you know, progressive and post-Mormons ever. So please come. Please support it. Please tell your friends. We want to fill the room. Fill the Salt Palace. Any final? We've, we've shared a lot. Uh, <laughs> you guys have lived up to all my, exceeded all my expectations, oh, which are always high anyway. This is so beautiful. <laughs> Any final things you didn't get to talk about or say that you want to share? Final wisdom for people, either of you want to give you one last chance to to kind of share. Did we did we overturn all the stones? I think we did plenty. Yeah. I'm sure people are sick of hearing my nasally uh, voice for a <laughs> time. Um, yeah, final yeah. words of wisdom. Yeah, I guess that, I mean, I guess it's, cliche but it's just if you are going through this you're not alone um and it's okay to have questions and in fact it's good to have questions and I hope my kids grow up questioning things I don't want them to be sheep and just because I tell them things then that's necessarily a hundred percent the truth I want them to think for themselves and my parents instilled that in me and I I hope that all adults will continue to act that way and it's okay to question things and do research yourself and and know that you're not strange or wrong for feeling that way and you know if you want to reach out to me I'm happy to talk to anyone and um yeah I there's there's light at the end of the tunnel and it can be a really positive place and anyone who's suffering I I hope that it ends soon and that uh, that you have a good support system with you. How how would you want people to reach out to you if like Facebook, Instagram, like email? yeah, maybe DM me on Instagram. Okay, I don't. I'm I'm really bad with social media or email or anything like that. But I'll I'll try to keep an eye on those. Okay, and you're you go by Alex. Yeah, I think Sermon. I'm Alexandra dot Sermon. Dot Sermon. I think so. On Instagram, mm-hmm. Alexandra dot Sermon, Instagram. Thank Boom. you. That's beautiful. Wayne, what do you, what do you want to... I don't have much to add to that. I feel like I've talked plenty and people are probably sick of it. Is there anything on me. your outline you didn't cover? I mean, yes, but like, you know, enough already, you know. No. <laughs> it's your shot, man. Okay, let's talk about biology some more. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Uh, this has been long enough. Let's I, save some for the talk. Yeah, I, I really appreciate anyone who was open-minded enough uh, to listen to this, especially all how many... <laughs> The sun is going down. <laughs> uh, did not expect it to, to go this long, and um, but I think we covered a lot know, of. You don't know me at all. <laughs> you don't know me at all. I didn't know I would have this much to say. Yeah. But um, yeah, thanks for everyone that's listened, and uh, you are not alone. We love you. Doesn't matter if you are the most devout Mormon in the world. I do not care. Uh, come out to thrive, and let's hang and get to know each other and feel a sense of community that maybe we've lost. Uh, when you leave that fundamentalist view of your own religion and there's a place for you no matter where on the spectrum and we accept you for what you are. I mean, my wife, you know, we uh, have only only love in our hearts and only the strongest of positive intentions for being here. And uh, I do, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs>
That'd be the same. Thank you, Alexandra, Alex. Thank you, Wayne. What an honor. I've been waiting for this moment for four or five years. It's been so lovely. You're both lovely. You inspire me. And I've been, I've been few, I've been through a few of these. (laughs) So thank you for that. Thank you for being willing to open up. Thanks for being so diplomatic and sensitive and, uh, you know, respectful of everyone. That's just such a great role model. I want that. We need to build bridges, not burn them. Agreed. And you guys are approaching this in a way that that I hope is going to build bridges. So thank you. Please let's stay in touch. Thank you so much for listening. Huge thanks to Cody Layton who freaking drove here from Salt Lake to bring all the equipment and set up. Uh, he does great work for us and we couldn't do it without him. So thanks Cody. You're Thank awesome. You. Thank you. And, uh, thanks to all our, our, you know, we, we've spent a lot of money to make this happen. Airfare, hotel, whatever. Uh, we would try and be responsible, but thanks to all the donors, your donations make this possible. So for those of you who donate to Mormon stories, Thank you. If you don't, if you appreciate this programming, if you find value from it, please do go to mormonstories.org and click on the donate button at the top right. 10, you know, 25, 50, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We, we exist at the, at the grace and at the generosity of our donors. We're transparent in our finances. We do all we can to be very responsible with the money. The widow's might, we consider it sacred. We're not perfect, but we work really hard to be And uh, if you will support us, we'll keep creating great stuff. And if not, someday all great things come to an end. This will too. But we're in this for as long as you guys are willing to support us. So thank you. Thanks to everyone who's made our billboard campaign successful. Rigby, uh, you know, Idaho Falls. Um, uh, We've now got some billboards in, in Spanish Fork and Provo. And we're grateful for our donors that have made that possible as well. Spread Spread the word, please. Email, you know, on social media, let people know about Mormon stories, episodes you like, share this one, all that stuff. Uh, Positive review on iTunes, positive review on Facebook, uh, all that stuff really helps. So thanks to everyone who helps us. Please help us if you can and know that we're not going anywhere. So more episodes to come on Mormon stories. We're just getting started and check us out at at thrivebeyondmormonism.com if you want to come to the Thrive Conference in November. And just email us if you have ideas or questions or thoughts or suggestions. We always appreciate your feedback and your support and your encouragement, frankly. And if you know of a great story that needs to be told, uh, we'd love to, to interview them. Because, you know, 1,100 hours isn't enough. We need at least 2,000 hours on Mormon stories. So <laughs> give us your best stories. Thanks, everybody. You guys take care. Thanks Thank you again. so much. Uh, Hall Sermons, you guys are awesome. Thanks, John. Stay in touch. All right. Well, Keep up the good work.